Hello everyone, Crydax here, and welcome back to Tier Listing Everything in Factorio, the fun series to kind of kind of wrap up uh, my Space Age playthrough, but also I just thought it would be fun to kind of have chats about every single item in Factorio. It, it's a fun, fun thing so far, and we've already done the first three tabs. Now we're into the Space tab, which, new update today, it got a new icon in the most recent Factorio update. Now the Space tab has a uh, cargo hub as the icon instead of the rocket silo with a rocket coming out of it. So that actually just changed today. Very interesting. Um, so yeah, just a quick reminder. Oh, I forgot to pull up my grading criteria. Let's open that real quick. Open recent. Uh, grading criteria. There we go. So this was our grading criteria from the first episode. Um, someone noted that I hadn't paid too much attention to the quality effects criteria, and I think that's true. Um, I think more or less most things get better with quality in a way that's fairly similar. Um, there are there are certain things that I probably was not giving enough uh, kudos to quality being amazing. Like for example, um, accumulators, you know, have a much bigger bonus to quality, but at the same time, if they didn't, quality would actually feel worse on them because 30% more power storage wouldn't be that much for the cost that you're putting into an accumulator because you could just make two regular accumulators instead and they're not that big. So that sort of thing, it, it, that still feels pretty balanced. I'm trying to think of what items quality actually feels bigger than it should be. In fact, one of them is on this list, which is the grabbers. You know, actually getting more grabber arms is insane. And so there are there are a few things where quality makes a massive difference, but most of them it's kind of not that big of a deal. Um, this one, the thrusters are gonna, you know, they care a lot about quality just because you can only fit so many across the back of your ship. And so to go faster at that point, you just need higher quality thrusters. Yes, yes, I know you can make the ship longer and have thrusters in line, but uh, anyway. Yes, and exactly, Dave. Remember, everybody, the list doesn't have to make perfect sense. You're gonna disagree. It's This is not an objective opinion. This is a subjective opinion, and that's why it's fun. So please argue in the comments, but you know, keep it Keep it uh, classy, everybody. So let's start with the chunks themselves. And just a, also a quick reminder, everything starts at C, unless I have a reason to move it. So C is the default. It's not bad, it's not good. I have no comments. Um, or I have comments that cancel out. So we'll start with the very core of every space platform needing iron. It is the metallic asteroid chunk. These guys are kind of insane how much iron they give you. So I'm going to I'm going to call it B just cuz they're so you don't even need that many. Like they give you so much iron. Um and not even to mention that if you get the asteroid productivity research done a few times, then you're actually getting um like a higher and higher percentage of asteroids back. So the cost for each recipe is going down a linear amount, but since it's going down a linear amount, the actual effective ratio of the cost is going up like exponentially. So basically by the time you're done, you're only spending one fifth of a chunk per recipe if you're just doing the iron one. And so iron becomes almost free in space. And I, I actually believe this is why a lot of people are doing um, legendary stuff in space because you're going to get an absurd amount of iron because the the iron also gets that productivity bonus so the amount of iron you get from one chunk that you pulled from space is i don't even know what the math is what's the recipe produce someone someone uh tell me what's the recipe for? let me look it up Victoria wiki uh metallic asteroid yeah, chunks don't get an A because they don't stack, exactly. Uh, it gives you 20 iron. So we're talking 100 iron, but then that's quadrupled because of the productivity bonus. So we're talking 400 iron from one metallic asteroid chunk. 
And yes, you can also do the advanced version that produces copper, but that one doesn't recycle as many asteroids. So if you were doing a legendary setup, you would want to set it up so that you only run the copper one when you need to, and you run the iron only one the rest of the time, because then you just get basically infinite iron. So that gets a B. Um, the oxide chunks, I'm going to give them a D because they're just so, uh, you don't have enough of them. So their, their occurrence is a little too low. And I know that's kind of the point. It's a scarcity thing. So you have to reprocess the other ones to get more water. That's that's kind of the fun of it. That's the point. But but uh, I'll give them a D because you don't get enough of them. Um, this one is fine. Carbonic, C for carbonic. Uh, it kind of does look like a meat chunk, Dave. You're not wrong. I can't unsee that. Thank you. Uh, it looks like something you'd see in Planetons almost as like one of the the slaughterhouse recipes Also, hello ace acer Acero acero home hombre. Wow. That's a lot of letters um, Glam you enjoyed the evolution of asteroid processing text. Yeah, I agree. I thought I thought I really liked the having the regular asteroid processing and then going to the advanced asteroid processing and then also adding the asteroid re recycling into the other asteroid types. Between those three things, it felt like there was a progression of stuff you can do with them. It kind of felt similar to the old oil processing and then advanced oil cracking kind of thing. Um, Prometheum, here's my hot take. I think I talked about this about the Prometheum science. My hot take is actually that this should spoil. Um, I think it's really weird that they allowed for two completely different play styles to get Prometheum Science. Normally I am a proponent of player choice, but one of these choices is so much easier than the other that this feels like one of those situations where they maybe should have nerfed the easy one. And if the easy one is the intended solution, that feels kind of less enjoyable to me or less interesting. So what I'm talking about here, and spoilers for those who haven't gotten to Prometheum yet, um, what we're talking about is the Prometheum asteroids only show up once you get past the solar system edge. So you get to the solar system edge and then you start traveling from the solar system edge to the shattered planet. And that's where these red asteroids start showing up and you can get Prometheum chunks. However, to make Prometheum science, you need Prometheum chunks. You need uranium, I, I think. I actually can't even remember the recipe. I think it's bright green rocks, uh, Prometheum chunks, and biter eggs. Biter eggs, which spoil, as many of you know. And so the obvious choice, the, the, or the obvious like gameplay, uh, what's, the, what's the word? What they're trying to get you to do, kind of what they're going for here, is you grab biter eggs, you pull them up, maybe you make higher quality biter eggs so they spoil slower, you pull them up onto a really fast ship. It's gotta be really fast, because you gotta fly from Nalvis, where the biter eggs are, all the way to the solar system edge really fast, and then you can get into the red asteroid field and start making Prometheum science. By the way, you can only make Prometheum science in space. I didn't mention that yet. So that feels like the intended experience. So you're racing against the spoiling of your biter eggs. So the faster your ship is, the better. That gives you more time to collect Prometheum and craft Prometheum science packs while you're traveling into the, the Prometheum field. And then once you've either, once all your eggs are spoiled or you can, um, that's pretty much it. Once all your eggs are spoiled or you've run out of eggs, then you've made as much science as you can. You turn around, you take that home, and then you repeat, right? That feels like a really cool gameplay loop. I love it. I actually, I, I didn't do it, but I love the concept of it. And it's really cool. And yeah, the Prometheum chunks, like all the other asteroid chunks, they only stack to one. So obviously you're not supposed to just put them in a chest and take them home or put them in your cargo silo or what it's called. What's the thing on space? It's not a cargo landing pad whatever it is, the cargo depot on your space platform. Um, the hub, I guess, the space platform hub. Basically, it just it's obvious you're not supposed to store them. However, what you can do is just put a bunch of belts on your platform and store thousands and thousands of them by doing belt weaving, even without using multiple colors, by just by doing undergrounds in like a cross patch pattern, and then you do a full squiggle in the middle, 
you can fit a ton of Promethium chunks in a still relatively small space, and then you can just collect a bunch and then take them back over Nalvis, and you can craft your Promethium signs directly over Nalvis where the biter eggs have zero time to spoil. And that feels really boring to me. Like that's way less of an interesting gameplay kind of cycle to make the science. And that's obviously the correct choice if you're trying to be more optimal, really in any way. Why would you race against biter egg spoilage in the journey for Promethium Science? Like there's no reason to do that, even though I think it's the coolest way to do it. So I think they goofed or maybe Maybe that's the wrong way to put it, because that makes it feel like there's a right answer. This is just like my opinion, man. Um, <laughs> but personally, I think it would be cool if you could only craft Promethium Science past the solar system edge, and that way it would force you to make a really fast ship, race against the clock, against the spoilage, and it actually would feel like that cool challenge of, oh, I made it with, you know, 20% of my biter eggs left, or this time I was able to make the ship faster and now I'm making it with 30% of their spoil timer left. You know, like it makes you really push for that faster. And right now there's really no uh, incentive to go faster in the game other than you just want the travel time to be lower between planets. And this would have been the first time where you actually felt like it has to be fast or it won't even happen. And uh, I feel like they kind of lost that opportunity to encourage the player. Uh, Glam, I think you can use higher quality eggs in a higher quality Promethium science recipe, same as everything else. I could be wrong about that because I didn't actually do it. Uh, space platform itself. Um, Promethium science durability depends on biter egg durability. I don't think so. I think the science just makes it 100% always unlike agricultural science. I could be completely wrong about that. Someone could correct me, but I, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking it makes itself at full durability. So platform definitely goes up to at least a B automatically just cause it looks so cool. The graphics are amazing and that's half of why it exists. It goes up to an A because of the building on top of it looks so cool. Every, everything you build on a space platform just looks really cool. And can I bring it up to an S? I, I really love the space platform and the way that it looks. I think the reason it doesn't get an S is maybe more of a, you know, grading the mechanic rather than the item. Uh, yeah, and they are expensive. That's a good point, Dave. So it's, it's hard to make them an S because they are really expensive. They just look so cool um, when you're building out the platform. Oh, I just love it. I wish, I wish we had graphics like that for all building of all buildings on all planets and the graphics would be different based on the planet or at least maybe not based on the planet but it would be different graphics than the space platform obviously because it's not a metal floor that you're building on on Nalvis but it would be cool if when a construction bot built a building it would have some sort of animation similar to what space platforms do but like a planetary version anyway that being said my knock on the mechanic it, and we mentioned this a little bit, I think, in the last stream, I don't remember why, but just how as platforms get wider, that's what slows them down. And the weight of the platform is kind of irrelevant because there's an overhead of 10,000 tons. You heard me right. Not even 1,000, 10,000. So if you're sitting with your space platform at 400 tons and you're like, ooh, I was able to shave off 50 tons from my 400 ton platform. So now it's only 350 tons. That should help a lot because 350 is a lot less than 400 in terms of a ratio. You're correct about that being math and correct math. And you're correct that that theoretically in a real world environment where your platform weighs 350 tons instead of 400 tons, that would make you go a lot faster. The problem is the calculation in the game is adding a flat 10,000 to that number. So 10,350 versus 10,400, not really different at all. And so the speed difference is going to be basically negligible. And again, that's more about the mechanic than the space platform itself. But it is kind of a bummer that um, trying to make small platforms is not really that uh, helpful when it comes to speed. And it's much more about your engine to width ratio. <laughs> you could see a world where they made space platforms cost LDS. Well, Senor Fiance, that is the world that space exploration was. So I'm sure that 
that conversation happened because despite the fact that they were clearly always making a different game than space exploration it clearly has some similar concepts to the gameplay and they literally had Arendelle, the maker of space exploration, on the team helping to design Space Age. So I'm sure the conversation happened around, you know, do we make them cost LDS or not? And I'm very glad they didn't, along with you. Wait, are satellites a thing anymore? Why is this here? Do we still use satellites? What? Did, did, do you need to launch one rocket with a satellite in it? Or is this only for non-Space Age now? This is just 2.0 Sans SA. Okay, interesting. Um, I always kind of disliked satellites, to be honest, because they don't do anything. It felt weird to have this, like, victory mechanic. I guess eventually you got space science, but... It just felt weird to have satellites that didn't actually reveal the map. So I bring them down to D for flavor fail. Um, the game, the 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 one where you, when you launch a, a satellite, you, it adds an orbital ion cannon. That's clutch. I like that. <laughs> that was fun. Um, all right. And then let's see. One of these is the hub and one of these is the landing pad. I think this is the hub. Um, do I have any comments on the hubs? I mean, most of my UI UX complaints in all of Space Age revolved around the space platform stuff. So I feel like the hub actually is a bigger offender than the landing pad. <laughs> most of my complaints had to do with the hub itself and how things work there. So. I think UI UX wise, the hub really needs some help still, and I'm hoping 2.1 adds a lot of improvements to that. Um, one of my biggest complaints, just to list one, so you, I'm not just saying things, but one issue I had is that you can't easily, I know that you can in a really workaround way, but you can't easily create a request for the platform from any planet. You have to pick a planet, and if you're traveling between two planets and you just want to keep the platform supplied with, let's say, ammo, maybe you were importing ammo, you would want to import ammo on both ends so that you're not, um, so you're not basically needing to take twice as much each time, and you have to make two separate requests for that. Like that alone is already a great example of an annoyance and it gets far worse than that if you have something going between all five planets, for example, and you want to request the item from all five planets, or maybe it, maybe you want to request the item from four planets and drop the item on another planet, that's a perfect use of the any planet option. And then for those of you that are like, well, well actually, uh, the any planet option uh, would be bad because it would make loops where it's dropping items and then requesting them. Well, obviously they would add an exception for that. I feel like it's so interesting that people come up with this, like, yes, a loop would be bad, but there are ways to fix that problem. This is how we iterate on ideas. In, in game design, you don't come up with a good idea that sounds like something you'd want, and then there's one reason that it, it maybe would cause an issue, and then you're like, well, I guess we give up. No, you then fix that issue. Like, like you can iterate on the design, right? So that's my rant about design. Because the main reason I rant about it is because I've seen that exact argument every single time that any planet option is brought up. And I think it's a terrible argument because you can literally just add an exception, right? That's what. It, that's why exceptions exist, right? And and it could be it could be explained to the player for those who would say, well, an exception would be confusing because then the players don't understand why it's not dropping the item or sorry, why it's not requesting the item. And so let's say you did inserters and you were requesting them from these four planets and dropping them to Aquilo, then what it would do is when you're over Aquilo and by dropping them, I should rephrase that to Aquilo is requesting them. The, the Aquilo cargo landing pad has a request set for inserters. When your hub, which is set to request inserters from any planet, when your platform gets over Aquilo, that request would just be grayed out. And if you hover over it, it would say inserters are being requested on planet. Done. 
Now your, your infinite loop problem is completely fixed. It's explained to the player and it prevents infinite loops from happening. Obviously, it wouldn't prevent an infinite loop where you yourself programmed inserters to drop from the, like, you drop them into the trash slots, but, um, anyway. I can you, actually, wait, can you even trash things non-manually? I don't, I don't think you can, now that I'm thinking about it. No, you can, you can trash items from the hub end. So I guess if you were trying to trash inserters over Aqualo for some reason, that could cause an infinite loop, but that's getting into the weeds of like, okay, yeah, the player, if the player really wants to, they can make an infinite loop, but it's not just gonna happen on accident. Anyway, that's why they get a D uh, for that and many other UI UX quirks that I found bothersome. All right, moving on. The, let's do the grabbers. I love the grabbers. In fact, I think they get an S. I think the grabbers are the face of Space Age. When you see a platform flying, you know, through the, through Space Age, I mean, I remember when we all saw the FFF of grabbers, it was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Like, look at the little grabby arms, like grabbing all the chunks. It's so neat. You know, the the, the turrets destroying the asteroids is cool. That's fine. The, the thrusters and the graphics for the thrusters, great, amazing. But the grabbers grabbing the chunks is just so freaking cool. I mean, it's kind of like having the, um, uh, like the, the, Mining drones, you know, where like when you get your Digosaurus in Py Pyanodons, which is a mining drone, basically, it's so cool because like a little dinosaur goes out and starts mining uh, your ore for you. And that's just so cool. And it's a similar concept. There's something about the autonomy of each arm that makes it feel alive, even though it still is just a machine. It feels robotic and alive rather than just like an assembling machine or a mining drill. And I think it's just really neat. Um, grabbers are really cool. Also, like I was saying a minute ago, the uh, the quality effect of of grabbers is also really high because you get more grabber arms. So it doubles. It it not only doubles in its ability to grab things, but it also has more range, goes a little faster. It does cost more power. Most things don't cost more power when quality goes up. So that feels like a weird exception. I guess they felt like that was i mean is it really too powerful i don't know sometimes i feel like consistency makes more sense than perfect balance but that's a really subjective line of course of like is it better to just have quality higher quality things don't take more power as a consistent thing because then some things are going to get more power from it in terms of like powerfulness and grabbers i guess are doubling in their effect so maybe it makes sense that they cost more power um and when I say doubling, I mean from like regular to uncommon. Obviously, they more than double as you keep going up the chain. Thrusters get an A. Uh, it's going to be an A or a B. They get an A to start because they look so freaking cool. And I actually like, I think they did a good job with the complexity level of the fuel and the oxidizer. And you, you need to feed it to the different inputs and you can't just put a wall of thrusters and feed into one location. You have to either stagger the thrusters or you have to space them out. Like you have to do something slightly intriguing. I liked that about the fusion reactors. Similarly, it's they're thinking in not just a grid. And I like that. Uh, the graphics are just incredible. The S tier in terms of the graphics, but the knock on them is the whole fuel efficiency thing. Um, that feels like a, an entire system that exists in the game that feels like the complexity it adds is not worth the gameplay that it helps. Um, in most cases, it literally does not matter. You're, you're either trying to go as fast as you can because it's just a transport between two planets and you don't need like defense it's pretty hard to go so fast between the regular planets that you're starting to run out of ammo on the earlier platforms that you make that's maybe true but like once you've got a few upgraded things you can easily provide plenty of ammo at whatever speed you're going and so that's not really a big deal and and so the efficiency of the fuel like when are you when are you actually slowing down 
more slowly than your fuel production for a reason that has to do with fuel production and not I'm just trying to get hit by less asteroids. Your speed, if you are even attempting to control it, which a lot of times you're not, you're just letting it go full blast. So like we're already down to like 10% of the time when you're actually controlling your speed. Even in most of those times, you're only controlling the speed based on ammo supply and turret capability. So, so what percentage of times are we actually at where you actually want to control the speed based on fuel and oxidizer production? I mean, like, I've never once even had to think about it. So, so all that to say, I think they added an entire mechanic. When you look at the Factoriopedia, it looks complex. There's three different lines on a graph and you have to be pretty good at reading science graphs to understand what they're even showing. And, and all of that mechanic ends up doing very little to affect the player. It kind of just exists and you're gonna do what you're gonna do regardless of the fuel efficiency in most cases. Um, it's, a, it's a really weird mechanic in my opinion and it feels like the juice was not worth the squeeze. So that's why thrusters get knocked down from S tier. Their graphics are S tier. Um, them not being able to be flipped Dave, I do think they should have a warning for that because it does seem like a bug when you are being able to flip all the other buildings and you can't horizontally flip the thrusters. Um, I also think it would have been reasonable to allow you to flip the thrusters because then you could connect two of them, but not more than two. I think that would have been fine as well. I don't know. Um, but yeah, just a little warning, like the little error uh, uh, sound that it makes with a little like thrusters cannot be flipped, you know, that appears when you try to do it. That would have been fine. I think that would have helped. They might still add that. Exactly. Oh, you do get a warning. Oh, in that case, I think it's OK. I, I guess I never tried, so I don't even know what it does. I was just assuming it didn't tell you. Uh, okay, so let's move on to this guy because he's kind of boring. Um, how do I feel about the cargo extensions? Oh, you're right. You could just chain them. Yeah, I'm glad that you can't flip them, actually. Um, hmm. Overheating mechanic, by the way, 420 dude, is an interesting idea. I think that's probably best left to mods. That might have been too complex. Space travel and space age is already a pretty dang complex mod, but I I don't think adding an overheating mechanic to thrusters would be doable without making it too hard. It's a cool idea, though, for a mod. I mean, cargo bays are fine. They do what, they do what you need them to do. I, I think 20 slots is fair, given that they're 4x4. Four it feels like a little punishing given a steel chest can have 48 slots and it's only a one by one. But at the same time, obviously your goal is to, you know, like try to keep the space platform smaller, which again, I feel like was a little bit of a fail on the mechanic of how they did the speed calculation because making your space platform smaller doesn't really do anything for you. Shaving off space and trying to spaghetti a little bit more so you can make it smaller does not really make it that much faster unless you're making it skinnier. You can actually, in most cases, you could double the, the weight of your ship and make it twice as tall, shave off just a few tiles from the width, and that would be a faster ship. And that just feels wrong to me. Uh, but that's a complaint not about the, the hubs or the cargo bay extensions. So these are fine. I give them a C. The fact that they get upgraded with quality is nice. Um, crushers. Crushers are really cool. I like the shape. It's cool to have a 2x3 processing building for once rather than everything being 3x3 or 4x4. Um, are they the only square or the only non-square processing building? I guess recyclers, but those also feel a bit unique in their usage. Is there anything else? Yeah, so all that to say, I, I like the crushers. Really cool graphics. Um, I have no further comments. <laughs> uh, the new rocket silos. Hmm. The new rocket silos. I. 
first of all, the new rocket graphics are cool. I really like the way the new rockets look. They feel a bit more like an actual rocket. The old ones were weirdly bulbous and they looked really um, not aerodynamic and the new ones look quite a bit more aerodynamic and realistic. They still do not look like things that you'd make in Kerbal Space Program to actually go to space, but they do look a bit closer to that. Anyone ever set filters on their drivers? Um, yes, though I resisted the idea for a while. <laughs> it is the easiest way to, to keep too much of the wrong chunk from getting on your ship. I think it was Aylor that said, um, <laughs> And hopefully I'm not quoting the wrong person. I, I guess I'm not sure it was them that said it. But someone in my chat was like, I think I've seen everybody try to avoid setting filters and it just turns out that setting filters always ends up e being the easiest way to do it. So everyone ends up doing it eventually. All right, all right. So the silo, I didn't finish my thoughts on it. The silo, I like the new rocket graphics. I like the new rocket price. I like cheap rockets. I don't like how little they carry. It feels almost laughably small. You're like, oh, I can't even take a full stack of this thing. I don't know. And some of it is us remembering space exploration. Those of us that have played it and you can carry like 500 items um, on one rocket. So some of it is is that in the back of our heads. Um, hmm. And the player apparently weighs a literal ton. Yeah, you're trying to call me fat. Um, I do wish you could do mixed loads in a rocket. Like if you were, if you had a variety of requests that all summed up to be less than one ton, I wish they could go on the same rocket. I realized that the logic that would be required so bots could do that in a piecemeal way would be really crazy. Um, so I don't know exactly how that would work, but yeah. I think silos are, are in a good space. I give them a solid C. I don't think I'm gonna go up from there because they do have their issues in Space Age in particular. Uh, one thing I don't like is you cannot, <laughs> what can you not do? Actually, wait a second. Someone was telling me that they would automatically send when they're full but what platform do they get sent to? I think I was talking about this in last stream and I was saying it's annoying that you can't, because the very first thing I tried to do was manually put into a box all the stuff I wanted to send to my space platform and then have the inserters loaded in and then it would launch when it's full, have the inserters load in the next group, it'd launch when it's full. Um, and I'm pretty sure that wasn't possible they might have patched it into the game, but what platform, if you have three platforms above Nalvis and you have automated launches on, where does it go? I don't know the answer to this, um, but people were saying you can do, people were saying it does launch when it's full automatically now. So I'm a little confused about how that works actually. Um, interesting. That being said, it was fine. For the most part, the rocket silos were fine. It does, but you have to have a requesting platform. Well, then that isn't what I... People in chat, and I think this was just two days ago in the other stream, they were saying, because I was literally, I think it was this stream, or was it my review video? I'm getting my all my thoughts about Space Age when I said what mixed up. But I was basically saying, one of the things I didn't like is that you can't just manually insert stuff in and have it automatically launch. And everyone in chat, was really happy to jump on my back and be like, well, actually you can. But it sounds like, no, it, it doesn't automatically launch if it's not being requested. So that's not what I was talking about. What I was talking about is a push idea. Yeah, that's okay. I appreciate that clarity 420 because that's not what I was saying. What I was saying is the idea of pushing items to a space platform, not pulling. And it sounds like it automatically launches if that item is being pulled, but it does not automatically launch if you're wanting to push. Um, and that I would like to be able to do if you want to. Either if there's only one platform above orbit, 
it would just push to that one. And if there are multiples, you would have a way to select it. Like you could filter, like you could select automatically launch to, and then there'd be a drop down box and you could select which platform it would automatically launch to if it's filled up. Um, and it just wouldn't launch to any other platform. And if, and if it's filled and the platform's not above, it wouldn't launch to that. It wouldn't launch at all. It would just wait. Like that sort of mechanic would have been really nice. Um, and you also can't launch on a signal, which is something I've seen a lot of people request. So those are my complaints about platforms, but at the end of the day, or silos, at the end of the day, they don't matter very much because most of what you're doing is just automated stuff with bots anyway. So, so the main use cases, I think they covered pretty well. And, and I gotta say, having multiple silos going at the same time looks so cool. And for that alone, I think it's worth having the really small stack sizes that rockets can carry and really cheap rockets because you just get to see way more of them launch. And that's really fun. So I give it a C. Had some complaints, but also really cool. And then the cargo hub. I give. Well, we'll start at C. I have I have some negative thoughts and I have some positive thoughts. The negative thought is that you only get one of them. However, that kind of combines with a positive thought, because if you could have any number of them, that would be bad. I actually, they, they used to have that in the game. They wrote an FFF about it, and it basically just felt like requester chests in space, because you could just drop items wherever you wanted them, and that really trivialized the, the planetary logistics on the planet that you're looking at. You could just drop everything from space exactly where you wanted it. I agree that that's bad. I think it was good to say, hey, you can't do that. We got to we got to put a limit on that. However, only having one for the entire planet feels a bit restrictive and it's actually causing issues for mega basers, which is a, an issue that I myself have not run into and maybe never will. I still feel for them conceptually that even at the end game, when you have these massive planetary platforms, you can only drop on one spot for the entire planet's needs, that starts to feel a bit limited. Um, I guess people can always get mods, but at least for regular mega basing, I kind of, I think Factorio should do a good job of supporting, like you can go really big without adding any extra tools. So I would love to see a very late game research. It requires Prometheum science levels of research that allows you to have one more, maybe two more. That's it. Um, and 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 it just you know that's it because only having one really it forces you to put so much emphasis on that one little spot on the map i mean the number of trains coming in and out once you're dealing with like ultra late game amounts of stuff coming in and out of the planet it really limits what feels like you can handle. And at some point the bots get laggy because there's too much going on there. And the new bot logic is pretty good at spread out stuff, but I guess it's not really good if you have like tens of thousands of bots going to the same building and you have to have a million of the, the cargo extensions that are next to it, but not in a circle next to it because you need a bunch of charging robo ports around it. So it just feels, <clears throat> It feels like only having one can be a bit limited in the in the later late late game like the end game uh, but again that's not so much a complaint from me personally but conceptually i don't like that um you've had science spoil because the request wasn't large enough yeah yeah the the in my review i kind of got into this idea a little bit, but there's a lot of steps now to get an item from point A to point B. Because first you have to request it in the platform that's going to take it somewhere. And then you have to request it in the landing pad that's going to receive it. And that obviously has to be on a platform that has the room and it has to be on a planet that can get the item to the rocket silos fast enough. And you have to have enough rocket silo or rocket part production I'm assuming you have all of that, but that's also a prerequisite. And then once all of that is done, you now have to deal with the logistics of transporting the item from the landing pad to where it's going. It's just a lot of steps and that's fine. That's complexity. We like complexity. That's part of the fun, but it is, it can be a little bit tedious. And I think this is where logistics groups kind of start to come in and stuff like that. So 
Last stream you said you want to have a piece of Factorio shiny uranium in real life. So you're you're making one? What? You're handling uranium in real life? Is that what you're saying? If so, that's pretty dope. All right, planet rankings. Um, my my final thoughts on the space stuff because I I don't want to sound too complainy. I think it's really cool. I really like space platforms. I think they're a really good balance of challenge, but like they're very doable. I think they do a good job of adding some complexity to to not just having logistics bots everywhere or not just having one big train network right like having to do those extra steps to move items i think is actually good for the length of playthrough that space age ends up being um i think there are lots of little quirks and issues that cause some friction for players and i i hope that they can patch some of those out and improve some of them and mods will improve some of them some of it is just my preference right and that's where mods are supposed to come in where like i really want something to be like this but not everybody does and that's why i can go get a mod to fix it so like i realize some of what i'm saying is better fixed by a mod than the game itself so between all of that stuff um i think space age is in a really good spot i do think there are some improvements that need to be made though it's i wouldn't say space age is s tier yet i think it's a i think it's a tier not quite s tier i'm hoping patch 2.1 can get it to s tier but i'm i'm hesitant to believe that it will not not that i'm a doubter in their abilities i just think there are some core level things that they're not going to change at this point that might keep it from getting to s tier it'll at least get it from like an a to an a plus or something though or a minus to a or you know whatever one one uh not not letter grade what do you call that one uh sub letter grade i'll call it <laughs> higher you're making things that will look like factorial game. epoxy with phosphor and shape of factorial oh that's cool i love that maria you'll have to take a picture and send it to us i want to see the result all right all right In the interstitial grade yeah that those are words let's rank the planets now i want to note we're about to rank the planetary orders after this but this is just ranking the planets on their own so we're not ranking them in terms of the order you go in. That's a separate ranking, so I'm ignoring the order completely right now. Let's start with Navis, because it's it's your homeboy. Um, Navis. Man, I have a hair. Or maybe it's a Santa hat fuzz. Um, hmm, where does Navis belong? It's good. Is it great? It's certainly not bad. I, I I could never take it below a C for sure. Um, but right now I'm kind of trying to figure out what pulls it up. What what pulls it above a C? I think. I mean uh, the iconicness of it, right? It's the one that we've always had. Brings it up a little bit. So vibe checks wise, I think it's got to be at least a B. Um, The new terrain generation is absolutely amazing. I just, I want to commend Arendelle for that. Uh, it really feels different. A lot of people, including myself, like when you think about a dev post that says, oh, we improved the terrain generation. That, that always sounds nice, but in most cases, it's not going to be so different that you feel different, if that makes sense. A lot of times it'll just be like, oh, that's nice that the ore isn't annoyingly spawned anymore. Or, oh, that's nice that a forest isn't spawned in the middle of an ocean. You know, like we, there are weirdnesses that you notice as a player and it's nice when devs patch those out. But the change that they made to the, how the cliffs work and how the pathways work through canyons and forests and water to where it, it actually feels like the terrain is providing natural choke points for defense. All of that stuff, absolutely incredible. Like it, it feels like a different planet, even though it looks in many ways the same, the way it plays out is so nice. And I think it was Trupin on my podcast that was actually saying, he was like, I used to hate cliffs. I hate it. I would play with them turned off or I would always go Vulcanist first so I could get rid of them. 
And then he said on his playthrough, he was like, I didn't even need cliff explosives on Nalvis. And while I don't know if I went, could quite go that far, I do agree in the sense that the new cliffs on Nalvis are so much more forgiving and they're, they're not in the starting area, which is also really nice. So you can build your starting base without having to worry about it. So I do think that could almost pull it up to an A by itself. Maybe, but I, I don't quite know if it deserves an A because it's also not that special. It is kind of bland in some ways. Um, and some of that blandness is just because it's what we've had for eight years. Uranium, uranium is on here. All right, I'll leave it there for now, but I'll, I'll hear other complaints. Um, Fulgora, I'll go in the order that I went to the planets. This is not me saying this is the order. We're gonna rank the orders in a minute. So you, you be patient. Um, Fulgora is an A, like that's where I'm starting it. Fulgora is so freaking cool. The the way that scrap turns into recycling stuff and then you have to deal with all of that stuff, it feels straight out of a mod pack, but not like it copied any mod pack. And and it's now the base game. Like, I love it. It's so complex in a way that I question, like, is this too hard? Um, I was kind of dealing with quality, too, though. I think it's a lot easier if you ignore quality and you don't do anything quality related on Fulgora to start with. Um, but yeah, the scrap mechanic is really cool. Fulgora has some weaknesses, though. I can't give it an S in good conscience because I don't think the lightning mechanic. I talked about this when we talked about lightning collectors, so I won't harp on it for too long, but I don't think it's that interesting. I think from a graphics perspective, from a lore perspective, from a sound perspective, from like a, a visual spectacle, it's all very good for that. But the actual gameplay of it is kind of boring. You just build lightning collectors all over your base so that you have 100% coverage. Done. That's it. That's all you do. There's not. There's no more play to it. There's no nuance to it. There's no like, oh, there are certain areas that get hit by more lightning than other areas, but they're hard to get to, and I have to spend resources to get power from there back to here. What if, what if you had to, oh my god, I just thought of such a cool idea. Oh, I've had an epiphany. Someone go make a mod. Uh, Dave is going to go make this mod, and then I'm not going to install it, and he's going to be mad at me. But basically, what you do is you have it kind of like right now there's different types of islands right you have it so there are lightning islands and you wouldn't call them that but basically there are areas in the game that get hit by a lot of lightning and you have to go there with your lightning collectors and you have a special kind of collector that's different than just the protection against lightning strikes but it's actually like a collector for power so you you have two kinds of buildings now and and those collectors you put empty batteries in them and you have to then take those batteries back to your main base on trains to to discharge them. And so basically you're you're taking the, the charged batteries from these lightning islands and you're transporting them to your main base to give you power. And you have to have this kind of constant supply of charged batteries and, and you take the discharge batteries back. Um, some of those types of mechanics are already in some mod packs, but something like that feels so much cooler than what's in the game right now. I will again note, these are just like my opinions, man, and it's very possible that that would be too complex for the average player in Factorio. Um, but that being said, that's my cool idea. Take it or leave it. Mod makers can steal it. Uh, you know, I'll just come for you when you're rich. Uh, that being said, Fulgora was really cool. Um, the oil ocean idea, I could kind of take it or leave it. Having infinite heavy oil was cool, but without having infinite water, you end up not feeling like it's infinite anyway, because you need the ice to do anything with it. So it was kind of, it felt weirdly similar to Nalvis in a lot of ways, because now it's water that's limited instead of oil. So the whole process of oil chain stuff still felt similarly limited. It was cool to be able to make infinite lube, though, without any work. That was kind of neat. Um, yeah, I liked Fulgora. Also, the unlocks. We have to think about the unlocks from each planet. The mech armor is just dope, right? So having mech armor is so cool. Um, 
what else did we unlock? That's where quality three modules come in. And what else? Tesla turrets kind of don't matter. Oh yeah, the recyclers, oh my God. Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you wanna make Gambletrons, you gotta go to Fulgora. Though there was a part of me that kind of felt like I didn't need them yet. I kind of feel like you need Vulcanus to really take advantage of huge amounts of recycling loops because you need all those resources, just the, the iron and copper resources. So to some level, it feels like Fulgora plus Vulcanus is necessary for good quality stuff. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, on to Vulcanus then. <sighs> Vulcanus is weird. From like a, was it fun perspective? I kind of give it an A, but from like a design perspective, it almost feels more like a D. Like it was boring design wise to me. And when I say design wise, I mean the gameplay design, not the visual and audio design. Like that was really cool. I loved the visuals of it. I loved the, the audio stuff. I loved the demolishers and the way they looked. Um, and it felt like I was on cheat codes, right? And I, I used that exact phrase, I think in my last video, like Vulcanus feels like cheat codes. It's so crazy. Um, you literally just pop an offshore pump in lava and you grab like five calcite from a calcite patch and boom, infinite everything. And it just was like, wait, that's it? That's all I have to do? And now I can make infinite steel and copper and copper wire. Like I don't even have to work hard to make the copper wire out of the copper plates. I can just make the copper wire infinitely. I can make the iron gears infinitely. I can make the steel infinitely. I can make pipes infinitely. It just was like, oh my God, I, it's just so easy. And I'm, as soon as you make, as soon as you've started any calcite mining, it kind of feels like you're already at infinite everything. And it, for me, I already had the EMPs as well, the electromagnetic plants. And so it was really even easier to make tons of circuits out of all those metals. So Vulcanus felt very cheat code to me. I do think though that it's good that one of the planets feels a little on the easier end and one of the planets feels a little on the harder end. Labo spoilers. Um, like, I think that's okay. I, homogeneity is very good in games. You don't want it to all feel exactly the same. I actually think a lot of games try to balance things too evenly to the point where it's all homogenous and it all just feels the same. So there's a there's a balancing act that developers have to do to make things a variety of easy and hard that feels really satisfying rather than just it's always the same exact feeling the whole time. Um, but I think it gets a B. I think I think at the end of the day, it's still really cool. I think the foundries look cool. I like the tungsten stuff. The demolishers are neat. Having overpowered stuff is strong. Like it's an S in terms of just power level. So it would feel weird to bring it down to a C just because I thought it was a little boring. Uh, so I think I give it a B. It's an A or an S in terms of power level alone. Um, but design wise, it felt really easy. Even. I mean, it was already crazy enough to have the, the items super easy and free, but then on top of that, they made power easy and free, right? As soon as you have a little bit of sulfuric acid and like three ounces of calcite, boom, infinite 500 degree steam, and you don't even have to work for it. It's even easier than nuclear on Novus, which is already really easy. You just, you literally just need the turbines and you're done. So that, that felt a little kind of like a bad joke. Um, tsunami warning, Glem. I, I saw that earlier. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you'll be okay. Uh, it appears that you'll live. The quake was far enough away. Yikes. I do not live somewhere close enough to an ocean where I would have to worry about tsunami warnings. So that's a scary thing that I'm thankful I don't have to deal with. Now, I know some people would just dump Gleba here and move on with their life. And I know some other people would dump Gleba here. Ah, well, I don't know if anyone would dump Gleba there, but I know plenty of people would dump Gleba here. It is easily the most polarizing planet, which is ironic because you'd think Fulgora would be polarizing given all the electricity. Um, <laughs> but with Gleba, there are some really cool things going for it. And if you don't like some of those things, it's going to be an F for you or a D. 
And if you like those things, it's going to be a B or an A. I've, at least with most of the conversation around Glaiva that I've seen, both before the game came out and we saw a lot of people complaining about it. And then we saw, we literally saw before our very eyes, basically, the dev team responded to a lot of the complaints. They shifted a lot of the mechanics. I was actually privy to some of the more intricate details on what actually was changed and, and people responding to those changes as they were happening because I was in the beta discord. And I will say, it's a lot better. Like, it seems like about nine out of 10 things they did to change Glaiva changed it for the better in everybody's eyes. Um, both the people who still don't like Glaiva and the people who now do like Glaiva or always have because they didn't play the beta. Um, pretty much everybody agreed on a lot of those changes being good. Um, there were a few that some people didn't love or whatever, but for the most part, the changes were great. And all that to say, I think the spoilage mechanic is really neat. I think it felt like, and I said this in my review of Factorio, all of the planets felt like a mini game. They felt like a, like a puzzle of their own. And it felt like I got to play almost a miniature mod. It's like a miniature overhaul mod for those, you know, first five hours, maybe 10 hours that you're on a planet where you're figuring things out, you're getting the base set up, and then you finally have the science pack and rockets being launched. Um, that felt like its own little mod. Each planet kind of felt like a little overhaul mod. And the Glaiba overhaul mod, you know, of having spoilage and needing to loop things and your nutrients are, are turning into spoilage so that you have to make sure you have enough nutrients. That was all really cool. I loved that. And I really enjoyed the, um, just the idea that like, you can't just buffer things or let them sit on belts forever. You can't, you can't do back pressure. Oh, that's a term that shows up quite a bit in the Factorio subreddit and discords and stuff. But back pressure is where your production is generally m greater than or equal to your consumption. And so if your production is greater than or equal to your consumption, on average, you're gonna have full belts, right? And that's back pressure. And the, the, uh, the reason that is how a lot of us tend to play Factorio is that means when we add a new production line, we're already gonna have a belt full of those ingredients and we just get to use them and now we have the new stuff flowing. And sometimes that then destroys your back pressure because it's consuming too much, but then you go and create more production and you work your way backwards. And that way, on average, you're kind of only making what you need, weirdly enough, even though your production's more than what you need. I don't know if this is making any sense, but it's an easier method than like planning out your items per second from start to finish, like in Hellmod or something. So that being said, Glaiba tells you, you're not allowed to do back pressure. If you do back pressure, everything's just gonna spoil on the belt and you're gonna have to deal with lots of extra spoilage. So it's just this really cool idea of like, okay, well, I guess I'm just gonna do my agriculture. I'm gonna constantly collect these fruits and that's what I get. I have a certain rate that's coming into my factory of these jelly nuts and Yumako uh, plants. And that, between those two numbers, that kind of limits what I can do. And I need to work within those numbers. And if I want to increase those numbers, I need to increase my farming. And then I need... So it was really neat. I loved it. I loved almost everything about it. I think the only thing I, I slightly complained about is I felt like nutrients maybe spoiled a little too fast. And that was a little frustrating at the beginning when a lot of stuff is just in your pockets and you're trying to play around with stuff. And you're like, I can't even play around with it for more than a couple minutes before my nutrient supply that I was feeding into these bio chambers has now disappeared and I need to make a bunch more. And I don't have bioflux yet because I haven't quite gotten there in the research trees. So I have to make these crappy recipes and I need more Yumako mash, but then I need Yumako fruits and I haven't gotten the agricultural towers set up. So it did feel like the beginning was a little bit hard, but once you started getting a few things flowing, it was really cool. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the enemies seemed to be the main complaint that most people have on Glaiba. A, a lot of people that are mad at Glaiba and they're like, F, F minus. Um, those tend to be people who had their bases steamrolled by pentapods. And for that, I do feel bad for them. I showed up to Glaiba with uh, mech armor that had a lot of lasers on it and I just flew around 
and killed everything anywhere near my pollution cloud. So I don't think I saw a single pentapod attack my base for the first like 10 or 20 hours of Glaba existence. So it wasn't that big of a deal for me. I realize that's not everybody's experience though. And if, if the pentapods are knocking down your door from minute one, that is definitely a little bit annoying. Um, but that'll come into our planet orderings here in a minute. I don't think, at the end of the day, I think that it's okay that Glaba has enemies. I think it's okay that they attack you. I think expansion being on by default is okay. I can I could go either way on that argument, so I think it's fine. Um, so yeah, I give Glaba an A actually. I really, really, really liked Glaba. My complaints revolve more around trying to do Glaba stuff off Glaba. This comes back to my original point. It felt like a puzzle. It felt like a mini game. I loved the Glaba puzzle and mini game. I did not love needing to, to play that mini game everywhere I use a bio chamber. I did not love needing to deal with taking a spoilable item all the way to Navis to feed the biters, to take another spoilable item all the way back to Glaba to make the overgrowth soil like that. I liked the spoilage mechanic as its own little contained thing. I didn't like spoilage just being all over my quite literal solar system. Um, that that was where I didn't like it quite as much. Um, oh, uh, the, the main thing there as well is I didn't like that I needed a spoilable item for the prod mod, prod module threes. When the speed three, efficiency three, and quality three they all have almost exactly the same recipe, and you could use the same blueprint for all four of them, except the prod ones have a spoilable resource, which just changes everything. And it just felt like, did we really need to do it that way? Couldn't we have used carbon fiber instead of biter eggs? You know, like it, it feels a little, you know, back to the idea of uh, consistency. That's a place where the dev team broke consistency on purpose and that's gonna have pros and cons. I think for my personal taste, that was a little bit more of a con than a pro uh, to need biter eggs for those, but at the same time, it's it's fine. Uh, okay, so yeah, all that to say, I really liked Glaba. It was, I think, my favorite mini game of all five of them. As far as just the mini game on the planet itself and the, you know, the five to eight hours that it took, amazing. Aquilo, Aquilo, Aquilo was sweet. It was my favorite visually. I loved the, the icy look. I've always liked ice planets. You know, Hoth was, was always one of my faves. Um, obviously, it can look boring if it was just flat white everything, but they found a way to make it look visually spectacular because you're on this island and there's the, there's the ice, but there's also the ice with snow on it. And then there's the little islands that have the the fluorine on them. So it was it was pretty neat. Um, <sighs> heat pipe mechanic was boring. Interesting. Um, I kind of disagree. I think it was. Well, yes, but no, I, I'm looking for a different word than boring. I think what I said in my review is that the heat my heat pipe mechanic. I really liked it. I liked that it forced you to build a different shape for everything. You couldn't use any of your other blueprints. You had to think differently. What I didn't like is that once you kind of figured out how to do it, it, it didn't provide a continuing challenge of any way. It was kind of like, well, I just have to have these lines of heat pipes with their little arms going to touch the building or the belts or the inserters or, you know, there are there's more than one way to do it but there are i wouldn't say there's a hundred ways to do it there are limited just because of inserters aren't that long and buildings don't have that many tiles around them and that sort of thing if you're wanting to make a build that can be more than one or two buildings they do start to feel pretty similar and samey and so i think it was a cool mechanic but once you're doing it it doesn't provide that much more of a challenge it doesn't provide that much more of an interestingness to it and so once you're kind of spreading heat around the base, it's like, okay, I'll build this thing. Oh, bring the heat pipe over. Boom, 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 done. It wasn't It wasn't like that tricky. It wasn't like Glaba where every single item that you add into a loop 
makes it more complex. So I did think Aquila was easier than Gleba for sure. Um, yeah, Azrael, that is also an issue. I would agree it doesn't tell you the heat consumption. You have to look in the game files to find that out if you're curious. And even then it's not clearly communicated, but I think the argument there is you can just feed a bunch of solid fuel into heating towers and just make sure the temperature isn't going down. Um, but that's, I agree that that doesn't necessarily fix the problem of not communicating that to the player. Um, I think it's 10 kilowatts per pipe, not one. At least the chart that I saw online um, was 300 for the undergrounds and 150 or 100 for the same amount of uh, normal pipes. That being said, it also felt easy to keep everything heated. Um, so I almost, again, this is back to the difficulty question of like, what I think would be best for difficulty might be something that's too hard for the average player because I play stuff like Planetons and I'm busted in the head. And for me, I kind of was hoping at some point I would need to actually make more heat. You know, it's like, oh my God, everything froze because I added a few too many buildings and a few too many belts and pipes and inserters and now everything got too cold because I couldn't keep the pipes hot. I only had a two by two nuclear reactor and then like five heating towers. That's all I had and it was easily enough um, and the nuclear doesn't even run anymore. Like once I got all the heating towers set up and the solid fuel, which is basically free from ammonia, once I got all that set up, it was kind of like, oh, Boom, like everything is now hot forever. And I have an easy, you know, 400 megawatts of nuclear power that can just turn on to add more heat. Um, so it felt a little a little too easy to keep everything hot. But that again, that's more of a, a spectrum of opinion where like some people found Aqualo really hard and it almost made them want to quit. And if Aqualo was harder than it already is, they probably would have quit. So I think uh, dev team wise, I think they probably did a good job with the difficulty of Aqualo. You don't want the last planet to be so much harder that it feels like, cause at that point you're running into exhaustion. It's a long game, right? And you've already done four planets. One of which is kind of your main planet. So you've put in a lot of time and energy to this game already, and you're kind of getting to Aqualo, like ready to wrap it up. And I, I think for that reason, it's good that they didn't make it super hard. Um, yeah, jump starting Gleba and Aquilo can be can be an issue. I found um, my issue was that I couldn't figure out what the problem was. And I guess the same would be true on Aquilo. If it were to freeze over, okay, that sucks. You need more heat, but that's the only thing you know. And at least on Aquilo, I keep rotating this. At least on Aquilo, you know that more heat is the issue. On Gleba, my Gleba base broke, and I still, to this day, have no idea what went wrong. I had a couple, like as I analyzed the base and we looked into the, the production graph and the power graph, because that's the only history that you have available. As, well, as I looked into that, the power went off long after production of nutrients turned off. So somewhere, somehow, I ran out of bioflux to make nutrients. Like that's about all I know. But when I looked at the base as it was running, it, it was hard to diagnose what was going wrong, and the only way you could catch it is if you watched it right as it broke, you know? And that so that was hard to go back and see Gleba's broken, everything is spoilage, but I don't really know what happened. It's kind of like when you, you know, in the movies, a character walks into an old house and like everything, or another planet, or some alien research lab, you know, or some whatever, and there's skeletons everywhere, and cobwebs and they're shining flashlights around and they find some log book to try to figure out what happens and the music gets real tense that's kind of how it felt like going back to Gleba like uh how do we even figure out you know what happened here there's a lot of skeletons a lot of people died but what actually caused this I have no idea that being said I still really liked Gleba all right this is my this is my tier list this is space Kridax, space tab All right, and then, wow, how did I talk for an hour and 10 minutes about 
what is like 20 icons. Um, I guess we talked a lot about the space mechanics uh, as well. So now we're gonna do the planetary order. I know these don't look amazing, but uh, they're what we got. They're what I whipped up on short notice, so y'all can deal. Let me get the colors going. I don't know why you cannot, at least as far as I could tell, you cannot set up the colors as part of the, the thing. You have to set them up once you open it, if that makes sense. It's kind of weird. All right, so. The way that I did the planets was this one. So I'll rank this first because it's the only one that I actually have experience with. I give it an A, maybe even an S. I, I actually think I ended up going with one of the best options and I'm using best very lightly there <laughs> um, because best implies that you have optimized for your constraints perfectly, right? Or for whatever constraints we're discussing. The problem is everybody has different things they're optimizing for. If you're optimizing for difficulty, you want a hard experience, Gleba first might just be for you, right? And so best is very subjective based on what you're optimizing for. But uh, anyway, this was the route I went and let me talk about why I really liked it. First of all, Fulgora doesn't really require anything from Vulcanus or Gleba. The big miners would be nice for scrap, um, but at the same time, the regular miners did fine for the amount of scrap I needed. And belt stacking would have been nice, but I didn't really need that either. And apart from that, I, what do the, like, you definitely don't need foundries. I mean, foundries give you some more holmium for free, but like, that's not, at the end of the day, that's not that crazy of a deal. And like, you're gonna, I don't know. For the foundries alone, I don't think that required a whole nother planet. And then, I mean, what else, what else even is there? Fulgora is pretty self-sufficient. And so the reason it goes first in this order is nice because then you can just do what you need to do. It doesn't, you're not really gonna miss most of the stuff from these other planets. And then now you have electromagnetic plants and having electromagnetic plants for the other two planets is a massive boost. Even just taking them back to Nalvis, I don't think you need to rebuild Nalvis between each planet, but doing a quick like, oh, I'll at least replace my blue circuit build in in 10 minutes with electromagnetic plants instead of assemblers, that alone gives you so many free blue circuits. It makes launching rockets from Nalvis cheaper. You know, it's just like, that. it's a huge upgrade, almost as big as foundries. Um, I, th I do think foundries are a little bit of a bigger upgrade than electromagnetic plants, but at the same time, electromagnetic plants are an easier upgrade because they only need power. There's no calcite to worry about. Um, so yeah, all that being said, I just, I did feel like Fulgora first was really nice. And then you have mech armor, which is just amazing. It makes it laughably easy to survive the enemies on the other two planets. So as far as like survival and combat, mech armor makes it really easy. You can't kill a demolisher with your mech armor alone, but it certainly helps you survive a demolisher if you get into a tussle with one. So yeah, this was my order. And it, I, I mean, this one's almost obvious, like Gleba last is such an easy best answer. Again, depends on what you're optimizing for, but for a lot of different things that most players seem to care about or value, Gleba last makes a lot of sense. Because Glaive is the most complex, it also has, you get a huge benefit from having the other planets bonuses on Glaiba, but you don't need the Glaiba bonuses for the other two planets very much. The, the only biggest thing, that, or the biggest thing that Glaiba does that I do think you could argue for needing is belt stacking. Being able to get belt stacking early is huge. Like having Spider-Trons is fine, having, prod three modules is fine but but even then prod three modules are almost like a fourth thing they're not really a gleba thing because it's really like a you have to attach gleba to nalvis and then you do more stuff on nalvis and then you can make prod three modules really only on nalvis unless you then want to send those so really like prod three modules almost feel like their own side quest 
that you can do after Gleba. Um, they're not just something you unlock like the other modules. That being said, belt stacking is really strong, and that would be the argument for going to Gleba first, would be I want belt stacking, I want to build my Fulgora and Vulcanus bases with belt stacking from the beginning, and that's really nice. Uh, oh, you know what, Azrael, that's a good point. I should mention that. One of the other big things that Gleba unlocks is the asteroid, the advanced asteroid processing. And so being able to make calcite from space happens, and that's really nice. The only reason I think that's kind of sadly a moot point is that calcite is needed in such small quantities that it's just really, really laughably easy to ship the calcite you need from Vulcanus. Um, it's like, it's, I almost wish that it's stacked in smaller amounts or something so that grabbing it from space felt more compelling rather than just shipping it. Cause being able to ship up 500 per rocket, each of, each, each of those sets of 500 is going to last you like potentially multiple hours, you know, on, on a planet. So. It just, it felt unnecessary. It, it felt powerful, but it's like, I don't need calcite from space. Um, it's about having foundry prod on it. Well, you can do that without calcite from space though. You can do that with calcite from Vulcanus too. Oh, uh, rails on Fulgora, that very much is a, I think, a, what's the word? A red herring. I think, well, I guess it depends. No, it, it, it depends. I got lucky. That's the best way to say it. I got a good spawn where I had zero need for deep oil ocean rails to have a good like scrap availability. I don't know the rules of the terrain generation on Fulgora. I am under the impression that with exploration, most people are gonna be able to find a pretty good, like I'll build on this island and I have these tiny islands that I can get to without crossing the deep oil ocean. I think pretty much everybody has that situation, but I could be wrong. And if you don't have that situation, then yes, Vulcanus before Fulgora helps with that. Um, that being said, I just really liked this order because Fulgora felt like it didn't need anybody else's help, and it gives you the powerful results of the electromagnetic plant and your mech armor. And then Vulcanus already is easy enough, but it's even easier with the mech armor and the electromagnetic plants, because having the electromagnetic plants means that the absurd amount of copper and iron you're making now is also making an absurd amount of circuits, and it's easy to power those electromagnetic plants, because power is super easy on Vulcanus. So it felt... It felt like the biggest drawback of the electromagnetic plants didn't even matter. So it just felt like, boom, like I can make everything in infinite amounts on Vulcanus really easily now. And so that's where my module production started booming. And then at that point, now you have the two powerful ways to make kind of your base resources and you can use both of those on Gleba. So you need way less um, iron and copper on Gleba. Ah, Cirky, Cirky, come back. Where'd you go, buddy? Ugh. Um, so you needed way less of iron and copper on Gleba because of having the EMPs and the foundries, and that felt useful because then you don't need as much bioflux, and bioflux is limited based on your farming area, right? And so Gleba has these hard constraints based on terrain generation on how much stuff you can make. You can't just put speed modules in your miners like you can on other planets. So I actually think Gleba last makes a lot of sense for that reason too, because you're gonna have better modules, you're gonna have better production, you're gonna have better beacons, better, just better ways to control your production that will help your Gleba base do what it needs to do. So Gleba last, I think I'm gonna put that as a B just because I know this is, this is one that, I think this is probably the most popular that I've seen. Vulcan is first just because it's easy for all the reasons we talked about. Fulgora, because again, it provides a lot of strong bonuses. It doesn't really need the Gleba bonuses and Gleba needs the Fulgora more than the Fulgora needs the Gleba. So that all being said, but uh, I don't know. Should I put it at A as well? I probably should. These are probably pretty similar. 
Um, because having foundries on Fulgora is nice. It gets you more holmium. I don't know. No, I think I think I think I'm gonna. I think, I think Fulgora first is better. There's my hot take. At me, at me in the comments. Um. Now, let's rank the Gleba first. Um. <laughs> so Gleba first is crazy. I think. I actually felt like Gleba was so much harder than the other planets that I think the devs, and I know this is strong language, excuse the strong language, I'm just, we're all having fun here. I think the devs made a mistake by making all three planets look equally inviting to a new player. For people who are enfranchised, aka they're watching videos on YouTube, they're engaging with content, they're looking at the subreddit, they're they're talking to people on Discord, whatever it is, they're enfranchised to Factorio in some way. Those are the people who are going to know that Glaive is the hardest, and they're the ones who are going to know Glaive first might not be the best idea. If I'm doing Glaive first, I'm doing it for the memes or the challenge or whatever. That's all fine. But I'm talking about the player who just buys the game and has fun with it, which. I know it's hard to believe because we're all enfranchised. Literally, if you're watching me, you're enfranchised. And so you cannot imagine what it's like to not be enfranchised. Maybe you can because maybe there are other games where you're not enfranchised. But that's how most people play Factorio. And by most, I mean more than 50%. More than 50% of people who play Factorio have never touched the subreddit. They've never watched a YouTube video. They just play the damn game and they never make a peep about it. And those are the people who I fear for because there's nothing telling them that going to Gleba might not be a good idea first for reasons, you know, that are kind of hard to just warn about. So I think it could be a little better if in the tech tree, Gleba either costs more packs or it's offset slightly. So it's like tier one and a half. You know, if we're looking at like all those planets are tier one and Aqualo is tier two and Nalvis is tier zero or whatever. It it feels like Gleba like needs to be warned. Our players need to be warned about Gleba in some way. Um because it's a very different experience. And I think it's completely healthy that the game has a planet that is the hard planet and a planet that's the easy planet. Gleba and Vulcanus. I think that's healthy. I think that's fine. I just think it needs to communicate that to the players in some fashion, somehow. I'm not saying it should put a big, shining, warning light on the planet and say, warning, don't go to this planet first. Like, it shouldn't tell the player what to do, but some amount of information I think would have been helpful. Um, so I think that's actually more of a, like, design question on how the game can give the player some amount of guidance, but not too much. And that's a really hard question to, to answer properly. Yeah, Gleba locked behind purple and yellow science. That's a, that is a perfect example of a solution to what I'm talking about. Um, there are probably pros and cons to that particular solution, but that's an example of one that I think would have helped players realize, oh, Gleba needs a bit more oomph for me to go there. It still is totally doable. It just is gonna, you know, require a bit more finesse. Anyway, that being said, which of the, I'm gonna put both of these at D cause I just think Gleba first is kind of a challenge and a meme. And it really, I guess if you're obsessed with stacked belts, that's the only reason I can think to do this. Cause after you only go to one planet without having foundries or electromagnetic plants, you're not making productivity module threes yet. I mean, I guess you can if you have a Nalvis mega base, but if you're doing a Navis mega base, the planet order is kind of irrelevant because you've mega based already anyway. Um, I guess if you, well, now that I think about it, if you've Navis mega based, stacked belts might be the thing you care about the most at the because you already have made production of, you know, 600 plates per second or whatever, and you don't need foundries. <laughs> but if you've if you've mega based to the point where you don't need foundries, I guess to some level that's just. I don't, I don't think that's a very common scenario, I guess, but eh, I'm Kibitz. I looked at his base and it kind of looks like that. <laughs> he's doing, he's doing crazy stuff before he's even gone to space. So he could be a contender for Gleba first, you know, cause I think belt stacking is inherently more powerful the bigger your base is. And so if you've mega based before leaving 
Now this, Gleba first, could be a little bit of a stronger argument. Um, which of these is better, though? Yeah, green belts are good, but yeah, compared to stacking, they're nothing. Especially because stacking... I was disappointed by this. The planets didn't rely on each other's packs enough. I wanted stacking four, where I got four items per stack. That should be locked behind Aquilo. I was expecting when I go to Gleba, I just get a stack size of two. And then I need to go to the other planets, the other middle planets, and then I can get to my stack size of three. And then after Aquilo, I can get to my stack size of four. But you can get all the way to stack size of four from Gleba alone, which just felt really weird to me. Am I remembering that right or am I wrong? I'm, I'm only 80% confident of what I just said. Um, anyway, I do think Gleba first is D tier. Uh, I think these are about the same, to be honest. If you're doing Gleba first, you can do whatever you want for the other two planets. <laughs> I think in general, at that point, you probably want foundries more than you want EMPs. So I'll, I'll put Vulcanus first slightly in front. That'll, that'll be D plus, this'll be D. Um, and now we look at the other two where Gleba's in the middle. Gleba in the middle is an interesting choice, mainly because you're leaving one of the other planets for last. So the question is kind of like, which planet is best left for last if you're doing Gleba middle? Or the other way to think about it is which thing do you need the most to tackle Gleba? That's probably the best way to think about this. So do you want foundries and green belts and speed three modules? Or do you want mech armor and Tesla turrets? I mean that if you're if you're into the military thing, if you've turned up the enemy settings, you definitely want Fulgora first. Because the Tesla turrets do a really good job of dealing with Gleba enemies. So that military wise is the obvious choice. Um But EMPs versus foundries on Gleba, that feels pretty equivalent. EMPs makes it sound like I'm talking about a weapon, but we're talking about the electromagnetic plant when I say EMP. Um the electromagnetic plant versus foundry, those feel pretty equivalent. Mech armor on Gleba is so nice being able to fly around um, and have better weaponry and shielding. Um, quality modules are kind of irrelevant on Gleba. You only do quality on Gleba if you really know what you're doing or you're mega basing or something. Most people on Gleba are just gonna go with kind of ignore quality except for the final products like missile turrets or whatever. Um, so the recycling and quality is kind of irrelevant. So in that sense, speed three modules are better. Uh, artillery, kind of useful to keep the pentapods out of your pollution cloud. I actually think artillery is probably a more effective solution to pentapods than Tesla turrets because Artillery keeps them from attacking you in the first place, apart from that first time you take out the base. Whereas Tesla turrets just defend you from increasing amounts of attacks as the enemy expands into you. So honestly, these feel pretty similar. I, I feel like I can see good arguments for both. I think Fulgora gets a slight edge because of the mech armor. That feels really helpful on Gleba. Being able to go really fast, you can explore more to find a good spot to put your base where you have the green and the pink soil nearby. Um, then again, I mean, you can explore with power armor too. You just, oh my goodness, I keep knocking Cirque onto the floor. Sorry, dude. I need to tape him in here or something. Um, uh, is this my final, is this my final, uh, Final summary? I think it might be. And what's funny is it feels like the more important thing is where Gleba goes, you know? <laughs> and that says something, right? Like if you're ordering your planets based on where Gleba goes and the other two are kind of interchangeable, I feel like that says something. Again, I think what it says mostly is that Gleba is the most difficult. Um, Which again, I actually want to reiterate, I think that's a good thing for the health of the game. I like that the planets are heterogeneous in terms of their difficulty. I think that's good. I do also think that it could have been helpful 
to give the player a small amount of natural guidance towards the fact that Gleba is the hardest, and it does pose a significantly different challenge than the other two planets. I think it's a big enough difficulty spike to go to Gleba that it it's worth communicating to the player. I don't think Fulgora is a big enough spike over Vulcanus that it's worth communicating or it needs to be communicated, but I do think Gleba is. And again, that that is very opinion based and it's hard to, to know for sure what you need to tell the player and what not to, but that's my take. Uh, yeah, and of course, Dave, there, yeah, there could be a reason for any order. And again, what are you optimizing for, right? There's no wrong way to play the game. If you're like, I wanna have the hardest, most asinine experience, and I wanna hate myself and all the choices I've made, then yeah, go to Gleba first, like why not? <laughs> no, I kid. There are other reasons than that to go to Gleba first as well. Like like belt stacking, I love belt stacking. There could be a playthrough sometime in the future where I go to Gleba first, because I just want to get to belt stacking ASAP. Um, I do think a sad fact is missile turrets are useless in the middle planet uh, regions right um missile turrets aren't useful until you go to aquilo because you don't need them to kill biters and you might use them on gleba but you don't but but gleba is where you get them so that 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 isn't a reason to go to gleba it's like well i go to gleba to get the missile turrets to defend myself on gleba that's just a self-fulfilling prophecy that that doesn't tell you when you should go to gleba if missile turrets were really useful for dealing with some threat on Fulgora, right? Like that could be interesting. Um, I'm not saying Fulgora necessarily should have threats. That's just an example of what could have made Gleba earlier uh, a bigger reason. But there's no military reason to go to Gleba first, really. And I mean, Spider-Trons are like your automated armies, but I don't know. Do you need Spider-Trons on Vulcanus? to kill demolishers. There's like a million ways to kill demolishers, so it's not like you need spider trons. Um, any planet start on Gleba? I'm sure I'll do that at some point, Dave. Um, maybe I won't. I, I'd like to think I would, but like there's so many different ways to play this game. And I love mod packs, so how many more times am I gonna play vanilla Space Age? Probably a few, but I don't know if I'll play it, you know, that many times. But, uh, but yeah, this is the Krydax planet order. And this has been tier listing the space tab and the planet order. And I will keep streaming. So if you're here live, stick around. We're going to do the military tab. From those of you from future YouTube recording land, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think down in the comments. You tell me your favorite planet order and why. I love to hear it all. I, I read all the comments. Um, so thank you for leaving them. As always, stay classy. And I'll see you guys in the next video.